Hey friends, Miss Rosenfield here. I'm going to read the Scylla and Charybdis section and the Cattle of the Sun God section from the Odyssey out of volume two of our textbooks. Um, Scylla and Charybdis starts on page 583, so that's where I'm starting. Where we just left off, Odysseus had been past the island of the Sirens, so they sang that magical song to try and draw the sailors in, but Circe had told him to put beeswax in his sailors' ears so they were not drawn in and they did not die, and now they have to go past Scylla and Charybdis, which are two of the traps that Poseidon has set for them for blinding Polyphemus. So on the left, you can see Scylla is a hydra, one of those like six-headed monsters, and on the right, Charybdis is a whirlpool, <clears throat> but she's special because twice a day, the water like extra whirlpools down through these like rocks that look like teeth, and if any ships get drawn in, they get smashed against the rocks. And then after all the water gets sucked down and you can see the bottom of the ocean, then it spews in a geyser, which is also very violent and rains on everything. And so if you get caught in the whirlpool or by Scylla, it is certain death. And they have to sail very narrowly between them. So I'm starting on page 583. <clears throat> but scarcely had that island faded in the blue air, the island of the sirens. Then I saw smoke and white water, with sound of waves and tumult, a sound the men heard, and it terrified them. Oars flew from their hands. The blades went knocking wild alongside till the ship lost way, with no oar blades to drive her through the water. While I walked up and down from bow to stern, trying to put heart into them. <clears throat> so the men are really scared, and so they drop all their oars, and Odysseus has to go among them and kind of give them a pep talk. <clears throat> I'm on line 764. Standing over every oarsman, saying gently, <clears throat> excuse me, friends, have we never been in danger before this? More fearsome is it now than when the Cyclops penned us in his cave? What power he had. Did I not keep my nerve and use my wits to find a way for us? Now I say, by hook or crook, this peril too shall be something that we remember. So he's saying, don't be afraid. We've been through worse than this. Remember when we were in Polyphemus's cave? That was terrible. Although to be fair, four of the six men that he brought with him are dead now. So only two of the men remember that. But he's trying to tell them, we've been through worse than this. You're okay. <clears throat> Heads up, lads. We must obey the orders as I give them. Get the oar shafts in your hands and lay back hard on your benches. Hit these breaking seas. Zeus, help us pull away before we founder. You at the tiller, listen, and take in all that I say. The rudders are your duty. Keep her out of the combers and the smoke. <clears throat> Steer for that headland. Watch the drift, or we fetch up in the smother, and you drown us. So he's trying to tell them, like, we're relying on you. Keep doing your jobs. You got this. I'm on page 584 now, and you can see that painting um, showing Odysseus sailing between Scylla and Charybdis. That was all, and it brought them round to action. But as I sent them on towards Scylla, I told them nothing, as they could do nothing. They would have dropped their oars again in panic to roll for cover under the decking. So Circe told him about all these monsters that are coming up, and he told his sailors about the sirens because he needed their help in getting past. But he's not telling them about Scylla because she's gonna kill six of his sailors no matter what. She's got those six heads, Cersei tells him there's no point in even fighting her. The easiest way to get through is to let her eat six of your men and just keep going. So he doesn't tell them uh, because he thinks it'll just make them not want to go, which is reasonable. <clears throat> um, so I am on line 786 on page 584. Cersei's bidding against arms had slipped my mind, so I tied on my caress and took up two heavy spears, then made my way along to the foredeck, thinking to see her first from there the monster of the gray rock, harboring torment for my friends. Um, so you can see she's up like in a cliff, sort of, which is where she lives. So she's eat eating them from up above. I strained my eyes upon the cliffside veiled in cloud, but nowhere could I catch sight of her. And all this time, in travail, sobbing, gaining on the current, we rode into the strait. Scylla to port and on our starboard beam Charybdis, dire gorge of the salt sea tide. By heaven, when she vomited, all the sea was like a cauldron seething over intense fire when the mixture suddenly heaves and rises. So he's saying they're, they're crying, they're so scared, trying to sail through these two things. And he's describing how violent it is when Charybdis, the whirlpool, sucks the water in and then vomits it back up in the air. 
The shot spume soared to the landside heights and fell like rain. But when she swallowed the seawater down, we saw the funnel of the maelstrom, heard the rock bellowing all around, and dark sand raged on the bottom far below. My men all blanched against the gloom. Our eyes were fixed upon that yawning mouth in fear of being devoured. <clears throat> so while they're watching Charybdis, the whirlpool, is when Scylla strikes. <clears throat> I'm on page 585 online, 809. Then Scylla made her strike, whisking six of my best men from the ship. I happened to glance aft at ship and oarsmen and caught sight of their arms and legs dangling high overhead. Voices came down to me in anguish, calling my name for the last time. So he looks up and sees the men dangling in her mouths. A man surf casting on a point of rock for bass or mackerel, whipping his long rod to dip the sinker and bait far out will hook a fish and rip it from the surface to dangle wriggling through the air. So these were born aloft in spasms toward the cliff. So he's making a metaphor comparing when you go fishing and you pull a fish out of the water and it's like flopping there in the air. That's what the men look like. <clears throat> she ate them as they shrieked there in her den in the dire grapple reaching still for me and deathly pity ran me through at that sight, far the worst I ever suffered, questing the passes of the strange sea. So he says, this actually was one of the worst ones. This was really hard. <clears throat> we rode on. The rocks were now behind, Charybdis too, and Scylla dropped astern. So they've passed through Scylla and Charybdis for the time being, um, but Charybdis does show back up, just so you know. So now we're at the Cattle of the Sun God, which is on page 585. And remember that when they went to the land of the dead, Tiresias said, if you go to the land of the sun god and you don't eat his cattle, all your men and you will make it home safely. If you do eat his cattle, then all these terrible things are going to happen. And it was foreshadowing because that, we know, is what's going to happen. <clears throat> so the cattle of the sun god on page 585. In the small hours of the third watch, when stars that shone out in the first dusk of evening had gone down to their setting, a giant wind blew from heaven, and clouds driven by Zeus shrouded land and sea in a night of storm. So just as dawn with fingertips of rose touched the windy world, we dragged our ship to cover in a grotto, a sea cave where nymphs had chairs of rocks and sanded floors. I mustered all the crew and said, Old shipmates, our stores are in the ship's hold, food and drink. The cattle here are not for our provision, or we pay dearly for it. So he's telling his men, we have lots of food and drink on our ship. Don't eat the cattle. They're not for us. <clears throat> and I'm on the top of page 586 now. Fierce the god is who cherishes these heifers and these sheep. Helios, and no man avoids his eye. So he's the sun god. To this, my fighters nodded. Yes, but now we had a month of onshore gales, blowing day in, day out, south winds or south by east. As long as bread and good red wine remained to keep the men up and appease their craving, they would not touch the cattle. But in the end, when all the barley in the ship was gone, hunger drove them to scour the wild shore with angling hooks for fishes and sea fowl, whatever fell into their hands, and lean days wore their bellies thin. <clears throat> so this was fine. They didn't need to eat the cattle because they had all these supplies on their ship. But then there were a lot of storms. So they couldn't sail away. They had to stay there where they were safe and they ate through all their food and drink. So the men are starting to starve and they have to go fishing and try to catch birds, but it's not going very well. The storms continued. So one day I withdrew to the interior to pray the gods in solitude for hope that one might show me some way of salvation. Slipping away, I struck across the island to a sheltered spot out of the driving gale. I washed my hands there and made supplication to the gods who own Olympus, all the gods, but they, for answer, only closed my eyes under slow drops of sleep. <clears throat> so he went to pray to the gods for help um, because his men are starving, and the gods put him to sleep, or so he says, or he fell asleep. <laughs> now on the shore, Eurolochus made his insidious plea. Comrades, he said, you've gone through everything. Listen to what I say. All deaths are hateful to us, mortal wretches, but famine is the most pitiful, the worst end that a man can come to. Will you fight it? Come, we'll cut out the noblest of these cattle to sacrifice to the gods who own the sky. And once at home, in the old country of Ithaca, if ever that day comes, we'll build a costly temple and adorn it with every beauty for the Lord of Noon. So Eurolochus is one of his um, top sailors, and he's saying, Listen, we have been through so much here. We have survived so many things. 
if we starve, what kind of a death is that? We should die in battle, like honorably. We shouldn't have to starve. That's not right for us. Let's eat these cows. And when we get home to Ithaca, we'll put up this huge temple to Lord Helios and we'll sacrifice things to him and he won't be mad. Um, I'm at the bottom of page 586 on line 574, excuse me. <clears throat> but if he flares up over his heifers lost, wishing our ship destroyed, and if the gods make cause with him, why then I say, better open your lungs to a big sea once for all than waste to skin and bones on a lonely island. So Eurylochus' point is, and even if Helios is mad and he'd rather drown us by sinking our ship, I would rather drown than starve. Tap of page 587. Then, thus Eurylochus, and they murmured, I, trooping away at once to round up heifers. Now that day tranquil cattle with broad brows were grazing near, and soon the men drew up around their chosen beasts in ceremony. They plucked the leaves that shone on a tall oak, having no barley meal, to strew the victims, performed the prayers and ritual, knifed the kine, and flayed each carcass, cutting five bones free to wrap in double folds of fat. These offerings with strips of meat were laid upon the fire. Then, as they had no wine, they made libation with clear spring water, broiling the entrails first. And when the bones were burnt and tripes shared, they spitted the carved meat. So the crew tries to do this in a respectful way. They offer the best pieces to the gods by burning them and doing these rituals. They're not trying to disrespect the sun god. They're trying to do it in the right way, but that's not going to work out. Just then my slumber left me in a rush. My eyes opened and I went down to the seaward path. No sooner had I caught sight of our black hull than savory odors of burnt fat eddied around me. Grief took hold of me and I cried out, cried aloud, O Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, you made me sleep away this day of mischief. O cruel drowsing in the evil hour, here they sat in a great work they contrived. Lampisha and her long gown meanwhile had borne swift word to the overlord of noon. They have killed your kind and the Lord Helios burst into angry speech amid the mortals. So <clears throat> Odysseus wakes up and he smells the cow cooking, which is a pretty unmistakable scent. And he's like, oh no, they ate the cattle while I was asleep. The gods put me to sleep, so I couldn't stop this from happening. And um, Lord Helios is about to talk now about how upset he is that his cattle were eaten. <clears throat> I'm at the bottom of page 587 on line... 906. Oh, 907. O oh, Father Zeus and gods in bliss forever, punish Odysseus's men. So overweening, now they have killed my peaceful kind, my joy at morning when I climb the sky of stars, and evening when I bore westward from heaven. Restitution or penalty they shall pay, and pay in full, or I go down forever to light the dead men in the underworld. Then Zeus, who drives the storm cloud, made reply, Peace, Helios, shine on among the gods, shine over mortals in the fields of grain. Let me throw down one white hot bolt and make splinters of their ship in the wine dark sea. Wine dark sea is one of those epithets that we talked about, a descriptive name. So Helios is so upset and he tells Zeus how upset he is about them meeting his cattle and he threatens to leave Olympus and go live in the underworld. And Zeus says, nope, calm down, don't worry, I'll punish them. So we're at the top of page 588 now. Calypso, la Calypso later told me of this exchange as she declared that Hermes had told her. Uh, Calypso is um, the woman he's on the island with for seven years. So she knows the gods and they tell her things, especially Hermes visits her a lot. And so she is given a lot of information to Odysseus, but that's later in the story. Well, when I reached the sea cave in the ship, I faced each man and had it out. But where could any remedy be found? There was none. The silken beeves of Helios were dead. The gods, moreover, made queer signs appear. Cowhides began to crawl, and beef, both raw and roasted, lowed like kine upon the spits. So he's yelling at his men, but they can't fix it. There's nothing to be done. And the gods have made the meat that still hasn't been eaten start like crawling and moving. And it made the beef that's being roasted start mooing like as if it were alive. So it's very creepy. The gods are obviously upset here. Now six full days, my gallant crew could feast upon the prime beef they had marked for slaughter from Helios's herd. And Zeus, the son of Cronus, added one fine morning. <clears throat> All the gales had ceased, blown out, and with an offshore breeze, we launched again, stepping the mast and sail to make for the open sea. Astern of us, the island coastline faded, and no land showed anywhere, but only sea and heaven. 
when Zeus Cronian piled a thunderhead above the ship while gloom spread on the ocean. We held our course, but briefly. Then the squall struck whining from the west with gale force, breaking both forest days, and the mast came toppling aft along the ship's length, so the running rigging showered in, into the bilge. So um, there's a huge storm, which we knew was going to happen, right, because the men ate the, ate the cattle. I'm on line 944. On the after deck, the mast had hit the steersman a slant blow, bashing the skull in, knocking him overside, as the brave soul flood the body like a diver. With crack on crack of thunder, Zeus let fly a bolt against the ship, a direct hit, so that she bucked in reeking fumes of sulfur, and all the men were flung into the sea. They came up round the wreck, bobbing a while like petrels on the waves. <clears throat> so he, Zeus knocked the mast over on the ship, which crushed one of the men, and then hit the ship with a lightning bolt so that all the men fell off into the ocean and are like bobbing in the water. No more seafaring homeward for these, no sweet day of return. The god had turned his face from them. So you're dead, sorry. I clambered fore and aft my hulk until a comber split her, keel from ribs, and the big timber floated free. The mast, too, broke away. A, big, a backstay floated dangling from it, stout rawhide rope, and I used this for lashing mast and keel together. These I straddled, riding the frightful storm. So Odysseus has been able to kind of like rope together a couple broken pieces of ship, so he has like a makeshift raft. I'm at that break on the top of page 589. Nor had I yet seen the worst of it, for now the west wind dropped, and a southeast gale came on. One more twist of the knife, taking me north again, straight for Charybdis. So he's moving back towards the whirlpool, the one on the right, that's got all the rocks inside. All that night I drifted, and in the sunrise, sure enough, I lay off Scylla Mountain and Charybdis Deep. There, as the whirlpool drank the tide, a billow tossed me, and I sprang for the great fig tree, catching on like a bat under a bough. Nowhere had I to stand, no way of climbing, the root and bowl being far below, and far above my head the branches and their leaves, massed, overshadowing Charybdis pool. But I clung grimly, thinking my mast and keel would come back to the surface when she spouted. So he's floating past Charybdis, and his raft gets sucked in, and he's able to grab onto an olive tree that's growing on the cliff where, uh, where Scylla lives. Um, he can't move up or down. He's too far away from the roots or the top of the tree, but he's just hanging there, hoping that when the water comes back up from Charybdis, that his raft will come back up and he'll be able to get it again. Um, I'm in the middle of 589. And ah, how long, with what desire I waited. Till at the twilight hour, when one who hears and judges pleas in the marketplace all day between contentious men goes home to supper, the long poles at last reared from the sea. So here comes his raft again. Now I let go with hands and feet, plunging straight into the foam beside the timbers, pulled astride and rode hard with my hands to pass by Scylla. Never could I have passed her had not the father of gods and men this time kept me from her eyes. Once through the strait, nine days I drifted in the open sea before I made shore, buoyed up by the gods upon Ogigia Island. <clears throat> the dangerous nymph Calypso lives and sings there in her beauty, and she received me, loved me. But why tell the same tale that I told last night in Hall to you and your lady? Those adventures made a long evening, and I do not hold with tiresome repetition of a story. So um, Odysseus made it past Charybdis because his raft came back up and he was able to float away on it. And then he floated to Calypso's Island. And Calypso's Island is where he stays for seven years, the bulk of the Odyssey. And he holds hands with her there for a long time. And then eventually the gods tell her she has to release him. And that's when he goes to Phaeacia, which is where he is telling the story. So at this point, at the end of page 589, the frame has closed. He's finished telling the story to King Alcinous, and now everything that happens with Odysseus, we're kind of viewing in the present time, like as it happens with him. So that's it for Scylla and Charybdis and the Cattle of the Sun God, and I will see you next for the return.